Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Psychedelic Vantage. From a post I wrote on LinkedIn the day after the news came in, yesterday we learned of some very upsetting news, citing issues raised in the FDA Advisory Committee hearing that was held in June, the FDA issued a CRL, Complete Response Letter, to Lycos Therapeutics requesting an additional Phase three study for MDMA-assisted therapy for the treatment of PTSD. The study will cost millions of dollars, and it may take two to three years to be completed. As someone working towards becoming a mental health slash addiction clinician, I am heartbroken for the millions of people with PTSD who are failed by frontline treatments are in and are in need of new treatment options now. We should be grateful for the work done by MAPS slash Lycos the past couple of decades to spearhead psychedelic research, and at the same time, we can critique the trials they ran. The space can and will learn from the mistakes made. Some very intelligent stakeholders in psychedelic medicine seem to be very worried thinking that the recent outcome we learned of means that no psychedelic compounds will be approved in the future. I couldn't disagree more with this sentiment. So that was just part of my LinkedIn post. I, I wrote a bit more, but going to get into the video here. The reason I'm recording this is to really explain why I am not worried about the psychedelic medicine space moving forward and other psychedelic compounds getting FDA approval. And as you watch this video, I think you will begin to understand why I'm not too worried about that. Um, now, when you're watching this, keep in mind that MDMA is very different from psilocybin. It's very different from 5-MeO-DMT. It's very different from NN-DMT. And Lycos was presented with a lot of unique challenges because of the drug that they were researching. Um, now, with each point I bring up, there are probably valuable arguments against why why the, uh, the FDA shouldn't have made these issues be something that would get in the way of at least a conditional approval. But when you take all of it together, you can understand why they did not want, uh, as the FDA, why they did not want to approve this. To be clear, I wanted this to be approved very badly. And it, again, it's really heartbreaking for the especially the people who had been following the research. If, you're, if you were someone with PTSD following the research and hopeful that you could get this treatment in the near future, just really heartbreaking. Um, now, with all this said, I also think you are causing yourself more frustration and confusion than what is necessary um, if, if you didn't look at the data, uh, the issues, and just how the trials were ran, um, also the ethical violations. And I think to say that this didn't get approved because of big pharma and blah, 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 I think that's nonsense. Um, with that being said, let's, let's get into it. I'm going to bring up some, some of the, the, some of the ways that the Lycos trial was ran and kind of backing up what other companies are doing along with this. And, after this video, I'm really excited to be interviewing um, with Adam, um, at least for one of them uh, on my schedule, um, to, to get their opinions as well. Actually, a lot of what I'm bringing up is stuff they have already said. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. <laughs> let's start with very simply. This is very simple. Um, and I know the FDA approved it, uh, the number of participants in the trial saying it might have been enough to get approval, but it still doesn't change the fact that the sample size of 200 people in the phase three program in MAP1 and MAP2 trials, it, that is very, very small for a phase three program. Uh, in neuropsychiatry, we see much more patients in trials. Um, and as I said, I'm going to talk about what other companies are doing. Compass Pathways, for example, with psilocybin is looking at 800 people in their phase three program. Uh, the first study is um, complete placebo versus uh, 25 milligrams of psilocybin. Now, while this is to show efficacy, it also is 
um, to show a safety baseline. Uh, regulators will want to see zero drug in people comparing it to 25 milligrams, especially when it comes to heart safety um, and stuff like that. And the second one, and I'm excited to get more into this, that the FDA, and a lot of this is from the draft guidance that was given, that Lycos also didn't have um, the opportunity to have for them to see doing their trials. Um, but the second trial that the FDA requests for these phase three programs is a low, medium, and high dose, or at least a medium and a high dose. And this is to show a lot of things, but the one I'm going to focus on today a lot is showing a dose response. We hear a lot about people uh, saying the functional and blinding is going to make it the functional blinding unblinding issues are what's going to make it impossible for psychedelics to get approved. I think that's nonsense. Um, and I'll explain why that's, that's nonsense when I'll explain that these companies are going to be able to show a dose response. And I'm going to get more into detail with that later, but let's, so we're done with the first one. There's a bunch of them guys. Um, sample size of 200 people, very small. Let's start with the second one. 40 plus percent of trial participants in the MAPS uh, program had prior experience with MDMA. Obviously, this is an issue because that's not, you can't generalize that to the population who may get the drug in the future. Um, now, critics of this critique <laughs> will, you know, they'll point out something very important that even the, the maps looked at people who didn't have prior experience versus people who did, and the results were pretty much the same. Now, with that being said, if you're comparing those two groups, again, small sample size. Um, now, what is Compass doing as an example? They're, they are capping it at 15% prior experience with psilocybin in their phase three program. Um, I believe the phase two program, it was capped out at 10%. They only ended up having 6%, but I think because of the passage of time, they're um, moving it up to 15%. My guess is that's because they understand that, you know, these drugs are becoming more popular. Um, people are taking them uh, more around the world. Um, so as I promised, going to get more into the, into the dose response here. Um, unfortunately, Lycos couldn't do this with MDMA because lower doses made people feel worse. Um, and that would really compromise the data. So this is from another comment I made on LinkedIn. And this is not me being original with my thought process or anything. It's listening to really um, specifically Srini Rao from a tie explain, explain this so beautifully. Uh, also Doug Drysdale from Sybin did as well. Um, so I was kind of taking what they said and putting into my own words here. Also on a LinkedIn comment on someone's post. So again, I think it's very important to note that other companies in the space will be able to show a dose response in their trials. Unfortunately for Lycos, local, local, lower doses actually made people worse. So with Compass and MindMed in the phase 2B readouts, um, this is a great example. They demonstrated that even though people knew they received a drug, in the low and medium dose groups, specifically the medium dose is really important to focus on. Um, so again, they demonstrated that even though people knew they received the drug in the medium dose groups, in mostly psychedelic naive trial participants, um, the higher dose groups performed much better. So regulators won't be able to say, oh, people are just getting better because they know they got the drug. No, these companies are demonstrating that it's more than just unblinding. It's people, again, because both the 10 milligram and the 25 milligram group, they, they knew they got the drug, right? But yet the, the 25 milligram dose, the dose we've always for quite some time in the space known that this was probably going to be the most therapeutic dose did so did did a lot better and that's really important this this is crucial for people to understand um there's a lot of real listen there's a, a lot of people way smarter than me uh, especially clinicians who are, are really worried they won't be able to 
I guess, work alongside psychedelics in the future uh, because of the functional and blinding thing. And they, they are not, I, I don't think they've heard about this dose response thing that uh, other companies are going to be able to do. So um, again, I can't stress enough how important that is. Now let's talk about long-term follow-up. There are a couple issues with um, the Lycos trials, and I'm excited to actually really hear the, the opinions of other um, leadership teams in the space here. But, um, you know, there were some dropouts in the long-term follow-up for Lycos. They weren't followed out for as long as companies like Compass will. They're going to be followed out for a year, if I'm not mistaken. The big issue that I saw um, that other people pointed out, um, that uh, P after the trial completed, before the long-term follow-up, People were in the trials were taking MDMA and other illicit drugs to treat their PTSD after the trial completed. Now, why is this problematic? This is problematic because regulators will think, first of all, did they get addicted to the drugs um, or did they have to use these drugs again because they didn't work well in the first place for them? Um, so that's, that's a, it's a really big, it's a really big issue. And I'm almost positive that in the, the trials run by Compass, Beckley, Atai, they are going to, you know, tell people in the trials that, you know, if you're going to participate in this trial, you're going to have to abstain from the use of other substances, uh, throughout the trial. I'm not blaming the trial participants. I think this is the fault of Lycos here, um, the, re the reality is they, they made a lot of avoidable mistakes, and that's what makes all of this really frustrating, um, especially with um, not collecting uh, positive adverse event data that the FDA explicitly asked for. Just, I mean, I guess take it to the investment side here. In terms of them running another trial, if I'm an investor, I'm not putting my money into that company to run more trials unless they get, um, you know maybe new management team. I don't know. Just the mistakes made were pretty crazy. Um, I think they, there's issues also with liver toxicity tests and heart safety data. And besides the avoidable mistakes in terms of collecting certain data, I mean, there's ethical violations we know happened in one of the trial sites in the phase two program. Um, it, it just paints a bad picture for the company submitting uh, the new drug application. Let's be honest here. And that was also horrible what happened. I was re-watching the video of what happened in that therapy session. It's really highly disturbing. And the fact that that happened in clinical trial settings, um, you know, it makes people pause and say, what does this look like when the drug is approved? And again, MDMA is a different beast than psilocybin, et cetera. And that's the other very important point here, everyone. Um, so a lot of the therapy done in the trial with MAPS, a lot of it actually was done during the MDMA session itself, which is also another problem. The therapists were unblinded. They knew the person got the drug. It was very clear to them. And that could have affected the way they also did their therapy. So... With psilocybin, I mean, a lot of you know, um, probably, uh, if you're watching this channel, my guess is, um, it's a very inward experience. And when you're taking high doses, you don't necessarily want to speak to a therapist or maybe even have the, the ability to put things into words at um, those high doses. So that's why, you know, it's really MDMA-assisted therapy. And I know there's a big debate between psychological support and psychotherapy. Now, let's pretend that they are basically the same thing for a second here, okay? The fact is that there will be way less psychotherapy in the other trials, and it won't be during the actual drug session. During the actual drug session, the only talking that will be done is if a patient maybe is having a challenging experience, the therapist is there to maybe hold their hand and say, listen, we're here with you, you're safe to feel whatever you need to feel. Um, stuff like that. But again, let's say even after that, it is psychotherapy. Well, it's not going to be the amount of psychotherapy sessions that were given in the MAPS trials. Um, there were nine other therapy sessions that were 90 minutes each 
that were required in these trials, three after each dosing session. That further makes it difficult for regulators to, to tease out the drug effects from what the therapy is doing. And, you know, Guy Goodwin from Compass made such a great point about explaining why the drug is doing most of the work here. So in the Compass trials, in the phase 2B, so after like maybe one or two preparation sessions, when the person got the, the psilocybin, um, they had a, madras, uh, an, a very impressive uh, antidepressant, um, they experienced an, a very uh, impressive antidepressant effect on the madras score on day one of dosing. So that clearly shows that, you know, they just had preparation sessions, maybe just giving informed consent and giving a little bit of background on what psilocybin is. The fact that the results were good on, on day one really shows it's the drug working. And these, uh, in terms of the long-term follow-up, these companies are going to follow these people out for, for a very long time. And we're gonna know, and we're gonna know the durability of the treatment much better, and also when to redose. That's also very important as well. Um, so again, I, like I said, Maps was positioning the treatment as, you know, almost a therapy, uh, just a drug catalyzing the therapy. And um, it was great to hear the the public comment section of the AdCom meeting. You know, one of the trial participants even said. Um, you know, it wasn't the MD, it wasn't the MDMA. Most of the work was really the psychotherapy. Um, so yeah, I guess some of the the last things I'm going to cover here, and I probably missed a bunch. Um, but there, you know, there's an open investigation going on uh, about accusations of hiding uh, severe adverse event data. Um, you know, we may not know exactly what the FDA is seeing right now, and that's something to to keep in mind here. All right, everyone. Now, I am very positive I didn't cover everything here today about the difference in research between, um, you know, Lycos Therapeutics, what they're doing with MDMA, and let's say other companies like Compass Pathways. Now, the good news is we're going to get to have... I'm not going to mention the companies now, but some companies in late stage trials who will come on the channel, and I'm sure uh, they will be they will do a much better job than myself um, explaining the differences in the research. And I guess you know one thing I will say, you know, uh, a little bit random here, but I think it's uh, it's something to talk about. So, you know, a lot of people are worried that the psychological support or the lack of a, in some trials, at least, they're claiming. Um, that there is no psychological support. Um, and people are worried that, okay, that these drugs are going to get approved and people are going to think it's the best, uh, clinicians are going to think, uh, psychiatrists are going to think it's the best thing to give the drug without therapy. Now, I don't know enough to speak on this, but what I can say, in my opinion, is I, I think a lot of this is to really just get the drugs through the FDA approval process. You know, they are looking at a drug. They don't regulate therapy. Um, and for example, S-ketamine right now, there are clinics that offer the FDA-approved treatment Spravato um, alongside therapy. It's happening right now. Now, I don't know how common that actually is, and I'm not sure what reimbursement looks like there with the therapy involved. But I, I really am thinking that a lot of this is to really just get the drugs approved and show that the drugs on the, by themselves work. And let's just get through that. And then, you know, I, I I am confident that it will the rollout will be okay um with these other companies and that um I'm confident that patients will will be taken care of. Um now that doesn't mean that there's no risks to these treatments and the data still has to to come. We still need way more data. Um and it needs to replicate from the promising earlier uh, studies we've seen. But again, okay, with that being said, guys, um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you you got something out of this. If you were someone who have, hasn't been following this too much, I hope that now maybe there's a little bit less confusion of, you know, what, you know, why the FDA didn't approve this treatment. 
and the differences in the research being done by different companies in the space. Really looking forward to doing more interviews on the channel in the in the coming days. We're going to have on, uh, at least for now, uh, unless things change, we have two companies in late stage trials coming on, and we have another company really excited about preclinical company working on neuroplastogens for neurodegenerative diseases. You know, we've seen a lot of companies looking at depression, anxiety, really excited to, to learn more about this company in the coming days. With that being said, everyone, uh, I hope you have a wonderful day, wonderful week, and we will talk soon. I will see you soon. Bye.